Hi guys, my name is Drea and I'm the founder of PreShift, which is an initiative that I've just recently started that is looking at hospitality as the gateway to actually revitalizing our planet and our communities. You know, as a global industry, I think we can all agree that we've contributed to some major problems, but you know, right now more than ever, we have the opportunity to lead a global movement that is going to shape our, the future of our world for the better. And uh, if you're excited about that, I highly recommend you check out PreShift. Um, now, PreShift is all about bringing ideas to life. It's about having conversations, but then taking it a step further and actually using those conversations as a base to create innovation. And hopefully that innovation is something that is actually doing so to help our planet and our communities thrive. And if so, then you're definitely on brand with PreShift. But anyways, in order to actually do that, it's important to have um, conversations with people and understand different perspectives. And so that's why I started this talk series. Um, you know, we're not here to judge people. We're not here to criticize. Again, we're just using this as a base to spark creativity. So today's conversation is with Trey Cates, who is the founder of Enrhythm, and he is going to be sharing his perspective on reimagining the way that we do business. Uh, you know, it's my first one. I got to, uh, you know, be honest about that. So it's going to be a little bit shaky, but there's definitely a lot of value in it. So just bear with me. Um, and shout out to some pre-shift members, Sandy, Mary, Pablo, and Juliana for being such active contributors, but more importantly, for uh, giving me some questions to ask as part of today's conversation. So thanks to you guys. Anyways, let's kick off. Uh, this is the conversation that I had with Trey. So very excited to have um, Trey with us here on the call uh, from Enrhythm. So just out of um, courtesy, I think it's always great to have guests introduce themselves rather than me. So Trey, can you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and, and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm the managing director and founder of Enrhythm, and we are a firm focused on creating a new way to both organize, design, organize, and manage organizations uh, across industries. Great. And, uh, and what makes you so passionate about this work? Um, I, I'd say I'm most passionate about it probably because we think and believe that there's more potential represented in organizations that's untapped. Uh, that, in essence, the current design puts a cap on potential and a new design we believe will release that potential. Amazing. So one of the reasons I invited you for this call is exactly that. Um, uh, we're looking at this from a hospitality mindset um, and the hospitality industry I think is, is a fantastic industry, but you know, it definitely has its flaws just like many other um, industries and, and businesses uh, in, in various ways. But um, I wanted to chat more with you about this framework that you've designed um, and something that you kind of consult with other clients of yours, um, uh, the regener regenerative framework. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that is and how you think this framework could actually benefit the hospitality industry? Sure. Yeah. You know, to answer that question, I'm going to step quickly back and then sure. in into answering the question specifically. I Really what we believe at the core of um, design is the ability to create the conditions for flexibility and ingenuity and creativity. And, and what we say is, is our prescription or even best practices get in the way of us being creative in our organizations. So working with frameworks is a way to allow for that creativity to be customized in the context of how organizations are working. Mm -hmm. So hospitality is different than manufacturing, which is different than, you know, a software company, which is different than government or healthcare. And as a result, we believe that how it's designed needs to reflect what it's most passionate about and the people that are a part of it. Mm -hmm. So frameworks give us that flexibility. And the regenerative framework is really based in living systems, which is the idea that we're all living beings. It's not, we're not machines. And so as a result, we really believe it's imperative that our design reflects our true nature versus something that we're not. And, uh, and yes, we've had an incredible amount of progress by 
managing things with a machine or a mechanistic mindset, but we've also created a lot of unintended consequences. So the regenerative framework is a way to regenerate potential using frameworks in a way that releases creativity and ingenuity. Got it. So it sounds like um, the idea is that we've noticed, or, or maybe you've noticed, um, that the way we currently run businesses isn't really working for the best. Um, and so that's why this regenerative framework is something that you're trying to push forward um, because it's going to be a more healthy system. Is that kind of it? Yeah, actually, so uh, to your point, uh, in a living system, uh, the living system is in essence um, managed by creating health in the system, which then allows for incredible productivity and efficiency. Yeah. Versus in a machine, the, um, the main measure is productivity and efficiency because it was designed to do one thing and one thing well, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so we see um, organizations like an ecosystem. It's a living system. And that ecosystem means that we need to manage very differently than we would in a machine because the machine was designed to do one thing and one thing well, and, and we want it to do one thing and one thing well. But that's not necessarily how we should be treating people. Sure. And that makes sense to me, um, which is why I think that this could be something great for the hospitality industry is mostly because this industry is people oriented. We're all about people. That's the whole yeah. nature of our business. <laughs> so, um, you know, in terms of this, this um, machine versus ecosystem, um, you know, I'm trying to, you know, for people who are listening, who are in the industry, it might help to give some examples. So, um, you know, when I think of a, a dishwasher, for example, in the kitchen, um, if for that for some reason that dishwasher doesn't show up in my experience and maybe in many others it's very possible that there's not a dishwasher that's just on call but the work for the most part can be done by somebody else in the restaurant it's just going to take away from you know their current role um, same thing with housekeepers in hotels um, you know housekeepers I think they do have people who are on call but the nature of their job is to have a checklist of certain things that they have to get done within the room. And as soon as they're done, you know, they have a specific amount of time. As soon as they're done, it's onto the next room. So it's just working like this the whole time that they're in, in, in motion. So I'm curious to know from these two examples, are, is this working right now like a machine versus an ecosystem? Well, I, it's a great question. And, uh, and the short answer is I don't know. Right. Okay. So one of the things I, I will say is, um, continuing to design and manage with an ecosystem in mind doesn't mean people don't have roles and responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Roles and responsibilities are going to be inherent as a part of the design because what we're wanting to do is to ensure that that role and responsibility is actually really related well to the person who's doing it. So it actually brings in all kinds of questions around recruiting and onboarding and all kinds of other things that I think actually are the precursor of is the person doing the dishwasher job or the housekeeping job a really good fit because it creates energy in them to do this kind of work. And so what we also often say is, is what does it look like for someone to throw in the, in the, in the job of a dishwasher, to, to thrive in the role of the job of a housekeeper. Those jobs may not change, but what I find when we have conversations with a lot of people, and we do a lot of work with manufacturers who have line workers, right, mm -hmm. who are, are processing things in a very regimented, these are the things you've got to do way. But what we find is, is most people have incredible passion to do what they're doing, but there are ways to engage people to understand how we can improve that process that would allow them to thrive and for that system to be even more efficient and productive. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, those decisions are made by a few people versus engaging the larger group. And so what we often say is, is when you think of it as an ecosystem, it's not about one person making a decision. It's about the understanding of that across multiple roles within that ecosystem. And so what does it look like to engage a dishwasher? What does it look like to engage a housekeeper in a way that allows them to thrive and the system to thrive together? And that's a very different question than most sure. people are asking in a lot of different uh, roles. Yeah. And that makes, that makes a lot of sense. You know, uh, this idea of, of cultural fit, you know, I hear a lot of um, companies these days are just, you know, we're looking for cultural fit. Um, 
And I, I guess I'm curious to know, you know, when I think of, of a hotel, for example, many people who are, let's say, onboarded in, are, they're given a uniform um, and there are specific ways to be on brand with that hotel, so to speak. But, you know, um, I, I do know a couple of good hotels that do allow people to have their own personality within it. But I guess I'm curious to know about, you know, your thoughts in terms of um, being on brand with the company versus being, you know, a cultural fit. Like, is that one in the same? I, 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 for me, what we often say is when you're designing with this framework in mind, we talk about the context and the context being defined by that organization, by the people a part of that organization. And they say, uh, as a part of that context, what this should be, right? And that includes management, includes, you know, different people across the entire organization and ecosystem. And maybe collectively it is, this is what our brand is, and this is how we want to embody that brand as a part of this process, and that wearing a uniform is, is consistent. And then there may be instances where wearing a uniform is inconsistent with the context and how we want to be seen in the marketplace or yeah. within our teams. Yeah. So to me, it's less about one decision is regenerative and one decision is not. Okay. It's actually more of understanding the context of the situation really then being consistent and aligned with what is most important so that it is a reflection of what really is true to the people who are part of it versus just an activity that people are doing that no one relates to. Yeah. I, I would find that if we were really clear in communication around brand and how it looks like for us to, to work and be consistent in alignment with brand, you'll find a lot more people really take more pride in what that is when there's an understanding and they've participated in it versus them being told this is what that looks like and not understanding the connection and the reasons why. Sure. Um, wow. So, I mean, just based on that, I have so many more questions. Uh, so let's see, I don't even know where to start at the moment. Okay. So first I would say, um, you know, let's, let's, let's go back a little bit to the person at the top, let's say making all this, the decisions um, and not allowing maybe some of the other staff members to thrive, so to speak, because they maybe don't have a say. So how, how would it look like, um, you know, in a regenerative way, if all team members um, or even all other staff or departments were working to actually have more say versus just somebody at the top or, you know, working up the chain of commands to get that sign of approval, like how would that look differently? Well, and, and it's, it's a great question. And, and I think it'll look differently in all kinds of organizations, but it will have similarities in that people feel like they're real decision makers in the roles that they're a part of and then the teams that they're on versus that they're giving a list of to do's and no thinking to be a part of that process, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you have, just as long as I have, been given a set of, set of things, hey, this is what you need to do to be a part of that role. And you look at it and you go, okay, well, these, some of these things make sense, but some of these things don't make sense, mm -hmm. right? It, it doesn't make sense for us to do that. And here are the 10 reasons why it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. That latter part of the process is incredibly engaging for people's voices to be heard. Now, there may be a reason why management or a leader say, well, we can't do it that way, and here's the reason why. Sure. But those things all should be very transparent so that you get engagement. What yeah. we find in most organizations is that we're not bringing our whole self into our roles, right? Mm -hmm. There's some aspect of who we are, are is left behind. And, and that creates a substantial issue in organizations uh, you know, Gallup talks about it through these eyes of engagement, disengagement, mm -hmm. and disengagement right now in the U.S. alone is creating a half a trillion dollars a year of lost productivity and efficiency. Well, in a hospitality industry where the majority of your expense is associated with people because mm -hmm. it's so high touch, imagine what happens when you have 50% of your people disengaged. Yeah. It shows up in the work. It shows up in the energy that they bring into their roles. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually can be done very differently and not, and create a better experience for your client, for you know those who are participating in your offerings. Mm -hmm. So for us and for me, when we think about this, 
we actually say that the engagement process is more of people beginning to recognize that their voice matters, that they should be heard, and that they have something to offer. And when all of a sudden you engage, even if they realize, oh, well, I, had a, I actually didn't have a good idea, and here's why, and now I better understand. That process is so meaningful that it brings a whole lot of different energy to the job that usually is non-existent in a lot of these kinds of um, roles. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting because I, you know, I go back to this idea of the dishwasher um, or the housekeeper, or whoever, um, who is just given that checklist. You know, they they might be able to to argue, you know, hey, here's why this isn't very efficient, and here's how I would do it. But if I really think about it, majority of the people in these roles, you know, English might be a second language. Um, you know, they they might have just arrived. They might not have the right education. Um, to actually have the knowledge that they can speak up. And so they just end up, you know, just do going along with the, with the work. Um, but, you know, thinking about how we can allow them to thrive. I had a, a company that I was working for, a restaurant. And, you know, I don't know that this is the best example, but um, they, they would bring everybody from the kitchen to do a tasting of the food that was going to be seasonal. You know, there was the start of the season and they included the dishwasher. It wasn't like the dishwasher was like not a part of the family. And it really helped just kind of bring about that community, which can actually help somebody thrive because if they enjoy their workplace and they feel like they get to know people over a shared meal. Um, but that's just, that's just one example. Um, and I think it's a wonderful example. And I think there are multiple examples that show up when we talk about it from a, a, a place of regeneration, regeneration or a living system or ecosystem recognizes multiple nodes and and uh and and what what i mean by nodes is that living beings that actually have something to offer that go beyond their given role right yeah. so what what about that shows up to where that dishwasher or housekeeper are participating in in understanding and providing value and and um and benefit uh, in something that's beyond their specific to-do list. Yeah, so. absolutely. And before, because I just have I just have so many questions. So before I get into any of those, I think it might be helpful to actually look at these six principles that you've kind of put together in, as part of your framework. Um, you know, to not just uh, know what each of them are, but maybe even possibly provide a simple hospitality example that might fit, so people can really understand it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so at the top of that um, list of principles is this idea of being holistic or holism. And part of the reason for that is, is the majority of our designs are pretty limited and siloed, right? So the ability, for instance, to your point, hey, listen, I'm hiring somebody to be a dishwasher. That's all they need to be good at. They don't really have value beyond that, right? Versus your example was a perfect example of saying, actually, their value and perspective is meaningful and needed, and we're going to design with that whole in mind and bring them into the process. So that's a perfect example of why when we think about holism, we think about being holistic, being able to see it all versus just siloed into one perspective or one department or one view. And so that's kind of at the top of this list. It's what we call it's, it's the core functional way for us to continue to design differently. Now, one thing I, would, I will be, will say to step back into it is, you know, part of what informs these frameworks is this principle designed approach. So when you design with principles in mind, it isn't prescriptive. It gives you a broad range of flexibility. Of, so what does it look like for us to design uh, when we're, we want to be holistic versus, no, 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 it needs to look like this in every single restaurant or list in every single hotel, right? Mm -hmm. It really provides a lot of breadth and depth of creativity. Sure. The second thing is evolution. And, uh, and you know, this may feel at times more relevant because – we, we would hear organizations often or leaders in organizations say, well, we, we need to evolve or we're going to be beat in the marketplace. Or if we don't change, we're going to be irrelevant, right? Mm -hmm. It's got that in mind, but it's really not just what we need to do from a marketplace perspective. It's what do we need to do from an organizational perspective? And that is a lot of things become sacred in organizations. We've done it this way and it's worked and, and we're going to keep doing it yet. There are many people around working those decisions that are saying, this is no longer working. Uh, we need to change it. 
and it and there is a better way right mm -hmm. and so we've got many many examples and uh, you know we'll use a pretty substantial example in the hospitality industry uh, you know when Airbnb started to show up right mm -hmm. they really disrupted the whole industry by recognizing and seeing potential in something that others saw no potential in yeah. and that was a whole evolution of thinking of what what does and is as a resource and and to me that's a perfect example of embracing something that uh, allows you to recognize that maybe the way you're seeing it the way that you're experiencing it is not necessarily the way it is and yeah. you can begin to embrace that yeah um, interesting I just want to point out as well um, it's uh, you know, some, at least pre-COVID anyways, um, you know, I would see all these videos that would come out of people being like, oh, you know, come and enjoy like this massive one pound pizza. Look how amazing it is. Or, you know, somebody else had like this massive ice cream sandwich or something like that. And they would be putting out these videos. But to me, somehow, it almost seemed a little bit gimmicky. Like they were just trying to put out something very like out there to attract attention. But in my opinion, I don't know that that seemed like something long lasting. It was just some, like a marketing ploy to get people to come and see their restaurant um, and that kind of thing. But I'm curious to know, do, like, are those, does that seem like more of a marketing thing versus like actually saying, hey, we're being innovative by creating this massive one pound pizza that nobody else has? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I think uh, and this might get into one of the other principles with this is idea of uniqueness. I, mm. Sometimes what I feel like we've done and marketing has done, a, um, I'm, I wanted to say a great job of reducing, and I say reducing, um, I, I'm going to flip it to say that that's not what should be happening, but they've, marketing has done a great job of reducing things down to simplistic terms to try to create a transaction. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what we've done is we've commoditized the entire process. Sure. So, and, and as unfortunately in our society, when something becomes a commodity, it actually gains credibility. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually think it is at the root, one of the root issues of what we're having to address is, is commoditizing things takes the actual um, creativity and value out of it, which yeah. is actually should be there. So when you think about <coughs> the hospitality injury in particular, there's so many unique experiences that people can have. Mm -hmm. There's so many offerings that could be put out there, but unfortunately it is all in comparison to versus a reflection of what is so unique and beautiful about that particular offering or that particular um, experience. Yep. So for us, it really is continuing to recognize how do we nurture the uniqueness that exists in all of these incredible um, um, organizations or entities or individuals that need to be designed around mm -hmm. versus trying to minimize, reduce, simplify everything so that we can all understand how we get the lowest possible price for that experience. Right. And, uh, and I, I think we lose something as a society and I think we lose something that can be meaningful to many people when we do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, and I don't know if this fits into um, uniqueness as one of your principles or maybe another one, but um, Anna Pollock, who is very big in the regenerative space, um, I was watching a, a video of hers and she was saying something along the lines of, you know, if we look at nature as a model, for example, you know, a flower doesn't do anything different or like marketing wise to attract more bees to it or something like that. Like it just is, and it's, you know, completely embodied in its own essence and it's, you know, doing its thing, you know, it's not trying to be something that it's not, so to speak. Um, so I don't know right. if that fits in your. Well, it, it does in multiple different ways. I think that's actually how, um, when you think about it from an internal organizational standpoint, that's actually how I think we should be hiring into organizations is really understanding what is unique about that individual and then matchmaking into what is roles and responsibilities within an organization to allow that essence to then shine through. Because unfortunately, uh, we've designed things to be more about how we can minimize and reduce then to create conditions where 
that essence is shining through that experience. And so from uh, an offering where it's a natural outflow of that uniqueness in that organization, or it's an individual, yeah, yeah. both of which are incredibly important because the more we separate from that, the more it is forced and it feels even more transactional and it is then commoditized because you don't have a relationship. And if there is no relationship, all you can do is do what we've done as a society, which is make a decision based on price. Sure. And, absolutely. Uh, and we, we all want that to change. So. Yeah, definitely. Which um, I actually don't know if this leads into one of your other, your fourth principle. I'm not sure if there's a specific order to it, but um, it, it kind of uh, made me think of your principle in, in mutualism. Uh, so I wanted to know more about that one. Yeah. So, so, so we'll, we'll see mutualism and interconnectedness being kind of very similar in that <coughs> mutualism is recognizing the inherent value of all the, the different living beings a part of whatever system that's being created. And when you design with that inherent value, you design differently versus some things are more valuable than others, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't times where roles or some of that uh, design actually really highlights certain things that are important in that time, but to recognize that we, it's going to be hard for us to do a lot of the work that we're going to do in organizations without the roles that um, typically exist. And you brought up from a dishwasher to a housekeeper to many other roles. So what does it look like for us to recognize a design that's mutually beneficial, mm -hmm. that recognizes the inherent value, and then to expand that value beyond just what's internal to recognizing gosh, what does that look like when we think about our clients? What does that look like when we think about our partners, like mm -hmm. suppliers uh, into, our, our, into the hospitality industry? Yeah. And how do we create relationships that are truly dependent in an interrelated, beautiful way versus one that is extractive? And that's really the, 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 the difference of something that's mutually beneficial is, is that we can design things that extract the value Yep. of someone or something uh, to benefit me, but at their expense. And that's what we want to change. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that happens. I mean, I think most people can relate to that. <laughs> you know, they, they've either done it or they've been on the other end and been at the expense of. Um, but uh, I think what's interesting about mutualism for the hospitality industry is that, like you said, this has a much bigger reach. Like if they... If the organization, the restaurant, hotel, whatnot, really knows who they are and who they want to be, the partners that they have can actually help change everything that they're doing. You know, they could decide not to go with suppliers um, just based on, you know, they don't agree with their, their principles or, or their values or whatnot, and they can decide to go with somebody else. Um, and that trickles down from everything from, you know, the people that you are buying, you know, at the farm, like what farms are you getting your produce and, and your meat and proteins from, um, you know, all the way down to who are you buying your, your uh, furniture to furnish everything inside your, your um, business. So that's, that's a really interesting principle. And I think, I think that one's a, a big one for hospitality is that mutualism. Yeah, totally. And, um, and I, I think one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, that starts to show up in, in, in a principle of mutualism or this kind of interdependence that needs to exist between all of that is that for, for there to be health within that system, it, it then really embraces this idea of developmental, right? Yeah. So, so we've got to create conditions where people have the opportunity to, um, to grow and to mature as a part of their roles within those organizations. Yeah. And, and, and without it, it's hard to um, have something that's mutually um, beneficial, right? Because mm -hmm. usually then you place emphasis on some at the expense of the others, where really we need that kind of approach across all of those that are all the members of that uh, system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think we've touched upon four of your principles so far. I think we have two left. 
Yeah, I actually think we've, we've done holistic, evolutionary, mutually beneficial, or interdependence, developmental. We talked about unique and evolutionary. So we got five. Okay, yep. And, yep. And then, so the last is this, that idea of nodal, uh, which yep. the way that you think about it is um, the, what does it look to redistribute decision-making uh, and power across an organization versus just in a few seats, right, or a few mm -hmm. members. And the best way to look at that is just think about um, I've, had, I've done some work with um, some firms and some organizations that are at the Fortune 1000 level, and, and they're spending a lot of time on risk mitigation, right? And part of the issue is recognizing there's a lot of risk the more concentrated it gets, right? Mm -hmm. You can think about it in terms of um, products, and you think about it in terms of revenue, but you also should think about it in terms of decision-making and how the organization's decisions are being made and how power is distributed across that organization. Mm -hmm. So when many people can make a decision and are capable of doing that, that is better than if only one person can make that decision. Sure. And so what does it look, for, look like for us to to build real capacity across an organization where decision-making isn't just made by a few people and, sure. and that, that, that it truly is equitable in a way that allows for that growth and maturity that we just talked about, but in a way that still serves the organization. This is not um, at the expense of the organization. Actually, it increases the organization's resilience mm -hmm. when there are more people that can make decisions that are in the best interest of the whole and uh, the customers that you all serve. Yeah. I, I wonder if there's also um, this, you know, there's, there has to be a level of trust that, you know, if you're the CEO, that if you have a manager in, in, a, in the marketing department or, you know, the HR department, that you trust that they are making the decisions best for what, you know, their little organization there. Because, um, you know, we hear this term, not just for hospitality, but thrown around everywhere. There's too many chefs in the kitchen, you know, and there's too many people trying to make decisions. But um, yeah, I kind of want to, you know, know if the chefs in the kitchen, like why does that maybe mess things up versus, you know, having people have decisions? Right. Like yeah. So, so, so just to be clear, when we talk about nodal and, and that there are more people can make decisions, it's not that everyone would be a part of every decision. So the idea there's too many chefs in the kitchen, mm -hmm. that might be true, right? And especially in certain times where, you know, decisions are needing to be made and we've all agreed this is how that needs to happen. But what we want is there to be a, a way for that system to be informed by more than just one person. Sure. So the other thing that comes out with nodal is this idea of diversity, right? Diversity of perspectives, diversity of opinions, diversity of ways of seeing that problem or that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a CEO can only see it one way. Yeah. So I actually see it as more about control than trust. Yeah. Because when you have a, for instance, you go back to that mechanistic or machine paradigm, the reason why everything is designed specifically in a certain way Everything has a specific role and purpose in that machine, all to be able to create that end goal, higher productivity, or it to be as efficient as possible. You don't design a machine to be inefficient, and you don't design it to be less productive, right? It, it is all for increasing all of those things. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when you take that and you apply it to an organization, you can easily see why and how we treat people. Right? You, sure. I've already made a decision how you're supposed to play that role. You're clear on what you're supposed to do. Uh, you don't need to be making any other decisions. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that is not the reality of our systems, our social systems. Right. Right. And so our design needs to reflect the reality, the inherent value of what the system is that we are operating within. Sure. And with that being the case, it forces a very different view because – the control view that allows for productivity and efficiency actually creates disengagement in a social system. Yeah. So what does it look like to open it up? And, and it does mean that some people are responsible for making decisions in certain contexts. And, and we want to free that up for those things to happen. It doesn't mean everybody makes a decision at every level, but what it also means is that that CEO somewhere in that process has to create the conditions for people to make decisions that are better informed, that can make it quicker, that can actually be uh, meaningful, 
without his or her involvement. And, and if, if a CEO or a team lead or a manager can't do that, I actually think it's a problem with the system sure. because I think there is a lot more opportunity and potential of people making decisions that are meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, normally I would say if this wasn't a COVID world right now, I feel like a lot of people in the hospitality industry would find it very hard to try and shift into a new business model, so to speak, just because they're already operating, you know, on such thin margins. They're just trying to make sure that they keep going where right now it's a very unique opportunity for people to actually look at what they were creating or are creating and try and, and change it up. And for, you know, a lot of these principles are, are things that they could actually try and, and implement for, for the better of their organization. And, you know, even, you know, branching out from there, the better of the organization, the better for, you know, their local communities, um, you know, even the planet, you know, there's, there's, it can have a very far reach um, depending on how. Yeah. They're and, yeah. And one of those things in particular, <clears throat> which I can speak to, and I know it's hard to do because of all the industries that feel the pressure of commoditization, it's hospitality, right? Mm. You know, I mean, that, that is a pressure that shows up in all kinds of places, but it's starting to show up in places where there used to be this artistic artisan approach that had real unique experiences associated with it. And with that came with a living wage that allowed for people to have a life pursuing that versus it's being part-time or something that I have to do <clears throat> with multiple jobs to be able to maintain my quality of life. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I actually think there is opportunity for those margins not to be thin, but we've got to rethink that whole design. It cannot be the way we've done it. Yeah. And, uh, and it also can't be that somebody in that system gets to benefit financially and nobody else does. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's got to be more equitable. And I think when you do that, I think the margins change because it's not about just competition. It's about collaboration. It's not about just trying to compare myself to somebody else in this kind of very commoditized process. It's about accentuating the uniqueness that can and the experiences that come from that. So I, I actually believe COVID and other disturbances will continue to force us to recognize that the current system truly is not serving us yeah. and until we're have the will to change it and there are many um people who are wanting to change it yeah. uh, and their experience is very very different than what the common experience is yeah absolutely and to me i think that's one of the most exciting things about hospitality is that we can actually be innovative and change with whatever is thrown our way because like i said earlier we're a people oriented business you know people are complex beings we're not just sure. like you said uh you know machines so anything that comes our way is what's exciting is you know we have the chance to innovate and keep going and and you know be part of this evolution as you mentioned as part of one of your um your principles um so I wanted to ask, uh, just looking at my notes here, because you, you'd mentioned about the, you know, possible opportunity to actually not work in such thin margins. Um, but I'm curious to know, this framework, uh, is, is this something, like how, how much better profit can businesses make by being in this framework, or is it actually about redefining what success actually means? I, I actually think it's both. Um, I, I think the opportunity for individuals and for organizations to recognize that there is more potential in their, in their existing operations will create a whole lot of abundance that is not being realized right now. And uh, so I do think it's about being able to recognize that if we were if we had a team of people were a hundred percent engaged the the potential is going to be different than when if there's fifty percent engagement mm -hmm. right um, the also that also is the case to know that you're you're not an island of yourself you're you're an ecosystem so that includes your clients that includes your suppliers and what does it look like for us to create something that actually brings them into that conversation when you bring them into the conversation, I think it changes the financial dynamics that exist. Yeah. And all of those things, I think, all play a role in recognizing that the current design is no longer serving the ecosystem. It's serving a few who can 
to use a very specific word, manipulate the system to benefit them, even if that's not benefiting the whole. Yeah. And so for me, it's about what can we do to design that differently to be able to create those outcomes. Sure. Now, in addition to that, I do think it broadens what you just said, which is the idea of what is success, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there is the, the thing we want to create is this intrinsic long-term health. So that there is this social uh, health that we're creating. There's financial health and wealth that we're creating. And, and there's the community or ecosystem or true environmental health. Mm -hmm. All of those things play a role in us continuing to be a resource uh, to the communities that we really want um, to see transformed or more empowered or increase well-being. Yeah. So all of that, I think, plays a part. So it is both a redefining, a reimagining, but it's at the same time, I think even, uh, I, I can tell you the most industrialized organizations recognize the problem with the current system. They know it's not working. We cannot continue to have disengagement at the levels that it is and expect that even if you were completely doing it from an industrialized standpoint where productivity and efficiency was your only measure, 50% disengagement, half a trillion dollars a year of lost productivity, you would need to change the system just purely on that. And, uh, and I think we've got lots more reasons yeah. uh, to consider a, a change. So I actually think it's broken even within the system of those that it's, it's benefiting a few. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, for some people, just hearing numbers, you know, of what could actually change um, or what they potentially lose helps people understand things a little bit better. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a great example. Um, and even just with, with people, you know, I think about this, this idea of this lost productivity. Um, you know, there's so many people who work in hospitality, mostly staff, but even middle management who experience uh, burnout completely because they are just being worked so thin in, in terms of, you know, the, there's a lot of hospitality businesses. And I think this is one of the questions that um, one of our pre-shift members was asking is, you know, a lot of these smaller scale, either restaurants or boutique hotels, they don't, they have limited funds and limited bandwidth. And so they're working with limited resources. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious to get to know your thoughts on that, because, you know, it's obviously a lot harder to try and bring more people in to help that. But how, how could these smaller scale businesses actually be able to, you know, work efficiently? Sure. Well, so, so what, we'll, we'll, just a, a, a little bit of a reframe in terms of that conversation, just recognize that, and I'm going to use levels, even though it's not about levels, uh, like sizes of business, every size of the business feels like they have limited resources. Sure. So it never goes away. So it, it's the, the idea that the small business is the only one that experiences that. No, you've got a hundred million dollar hospitality group that says, listen, we, we can't spend money on the things we want to spend, right? Yeah. I've heard it across the entire spectrum. So which to me, is a, it's, that means the whole thinking is wrong. Yeah. So we're getting ourselves in this kind of limited mindset of where most of how we actually achieve abundance or potential is um, based upon how much money we have. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think it's based upon the creativity and the diversity of the people who are involved. Yeah. And, and because I, I know that if the both of us got together and said, hey, we're going to start something in the hospitality industry, mm -hmm. we would begin talking about, now, who all needs to be a part of that conversation, right? And how would that be informed? And all of that would be super meaningful. And yes, money is a tool mm -hmm. about how we do it with quote-unquote limited resources. Yeah. But that, that is a, that's a no-win game, <clears throat> because of it always being quote unquote limited. Sure. But the potential that exists in people is unlimited. Yep. And in that to me is if we begin to design around that, it cr creates a whole different type of mindset. Sure. And so I'll go back to the Airbnb example. Somebody began to see resource, began to see opportunity in some place that nobody saw opportunity yep. or very little opportunity. Yep. And unfortunately, if that had showed up in other industries or showed up in other types of organizations, it would have transformed their organization and their opportunity to be a resource. And that wasn't about more money. 
that was about seeing it differently. Yeah. And, uh, and to me, that is what needs to be continued to be nurtured in these organizations is that creativity and that diversity. And I think the more we do that, I think it solves a lot of the challenges around thin margins or around being limited in terms of quote unquote resource or yeah. bandwidth to use that term, sure. right? That they people have or don't have in their roles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I try to think about it in terms of some of the issues that I saw while I was living in Australia. You know, there's a lot of um, hospitality companies um, that just hire backpackers because there's so many people who would go over on a working holiday visa and they would hire these backpackers and it ended up not doing their business any justice because these people are just there for a limited time. You know, they're just trying to make a buck so that they can go travel. Um, and I wonder, you know, there's so many hospitality companies who are just in need of help that they will get anybody <laughs> instead of actually thinking about, you know, how to hire somebody who works with their brand or their, you know, essence, so to speak. Um, you know, what, what are your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, completely spot on. I, I feel like there, there could potentially be a role, but, um, but for people that are kind of transient and are limited, but if your whole business is built around that, it's pretty tough to, to be able to embrace any of the principles that we're talking about because they're not going to be there tomorrow or they're not going to yeah. be there in a short period of time. Right? So how do you build depth and, and nurture kind of, you know, the potential that comes over time yeah. versus something that is just immediate? You know, we, we all know the limitations to make decisions based upon quarterly earnings or uh, short-term goals. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that there isn't guidance around some of those things. It's just that it can't be at the expense of that long-term health. Yep. And, and unfortunately, we make those kinds of trade-offs all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to touch on one of them, um, because I know we're getting down to time here. I want to touch on one uh, another topic that one of our other members put through. Um, uh, it, so it, at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're probably all trying to reach the same goal. You know, there, there's probably a bunch of us who, like you said, are seeing, you know, that there's a problem with the system and we probably all want to get to the same goal. Um, as an example, one of our, our members brought up a great point. Um, so right now during COVID, there's a lot of hotels who are designing their own specific uh, protocols for how to be safe and clean for for their own brand. You know, everybody has their own version. Most of the time, it's relatively the same with a few minor differences here or there. Um, and for her, she was, she was saying, you know, she's kind of tired of seeing 35 different versions of the same thing instead of having one to kind of span across. But I wanted to understand a little bit more from you in terms of is, is this something uh, like these trends that come about, if somebody brings, you know, finds a new way to, to clean, is that something that should be shared across the industry? Is that part of the ecosystem or are, are they going to be losing their individual, you know, self in that? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, one of the things that, um, that I'll say in reference to that, and it's tied back to these principles, mm -hmm is that, you know, there, there isn't, um, there isn't, um, IP right in, um, a lot of what we do. And unfortunately when we're in that protective mode, uh, we find ourselves limiting the diversity that could be of service to us and us to them. Right. Mm -hmm because we're trying to protect it because we're fear of, of losing our edge of losing our opportunity. Right. Yep. So on one side of the thing, it's like, to me, it's completely open source. Let's just share it. It's needing to be something that can be of, um, of, of service to the ecosystem. Cause if the ecosystem continues to improve, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is going to benefit us in a positive way. Right. Yeah. Um, no question about it. Yeah. On the other side, um, the sharing, and this goes back to a comment I made earlier, uh, around kind of best practices or prescriptions um, actually can do harm. And the reason why it does harm because it moves the ability from people to make decisions that are relevant for their context in what they are trying to do in a meaningful way mm -hmm. to, well, it worked there, so it should just work here. 
So I don't need you to think about it. I just need you to implement it. Just do it. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think there is something, um, um, dehumanizing about that. Right. Uh, sure. listen, you know, somebody else already made all those decisions. You just need to implement them. Yeah. And, and for me, the, the beauty for all of us is beginning to recognize that, um, that, that it doesn't mean there isn't something we can glean in exchange mm-hmm. in understanding, but what about that should change, right? Yeah. As a way to inform what's most meaningful to us. Yeah. And that's kind of how I would kind of approach that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, because I, I guess I, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, there's a lot of people who are like, but help, you know, competition is healthy. And, you know, we, we want to be able to keep this for ourselves. We can stay, you know, like you said, you know, on the edge of things. Um, but I think at the same time, in terms of regeneration, it's going back to that uniqueness that you mentioned. You know, that's, that's right. where you get your competitive edge is by being unique. So a resource like COVID cleaning is something like you said, will help the whole ecosystem for everybody because everybody needs that information, but that doesn't take away from your unique brand or, or whoever it is that you are. Right. And, and it's recognizing that we're, we're all related. So unfortunately when we create, um, we, we talk about boundaries, there's a, it's important to create boundaries of identity, but boundaries of separation actually are in a disservice to the ecosystem. Right. Sure. So we, we are in relationship. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we're in a relationship that is mutually beneficial. Sometimes it's a plus minus relationship where we're benefiting more than you're benefiting, right? Yeah. As a part of this. But ultimately what we want is more and more of those mutually beneficial, beneficial relationships yeah. as a way to design something that can be in service to that entire system. Right. Yeah. And, and I, we're, we're big into, uh, being in service to the uh, entire system uh, yeah. because it has benefit to multiple holes versus just a single one. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I came across a really interesting example because, um, and I know for, for many people who are probably watching or listening to this, this probably seems like it's just barely, you know, getting to you. There's so many questions that people will probably have, and I encourage you to have a look at in, in rhythm and, and look into this term of regeneration. But I was watching this video on... Um, on trees, and there was this uh, this person who was a scientist who who monitored trees. And I know part of what you talk about is you know looking looking at nature as a model. And a lot of people in, in regeneration are looking at nature as a model because it's the only one that we have. That's right. Um, and uh, she was she was basically saying that you know there's two trees that would basically uh, like if one wasn't doing too well, the other tree who was nearby would actually emit more of whatever resources the tree the other tree needed that wasn't doing so well and they would kind Mm. of talk to each other in this way and i thought that was very interesting and it's a it's a good example of what we're talking about here is you know there's a lot of us in the industry who are struggling at the moment and the most we can do is try to help each other out you know by still being you know ourselves and and unique to ourselves without giving that away totally uh and um and i and i and i you know, just to add to that, which I completely um, agree with, I, I, I just, I want us all to move away from the fear that if we don't protect, uh, it will be at our expense because right. it just drives so much of our behavior. And, and I get it because there have been instances of where we've quote unquote been burned or have had bad experiences. Yeah. But for us to be able to get beyond Um, us in that protective mode Um, Mm -hmm. and we can see it as an example in COVID right a lot of people should be talking to one another a lot of people should be figuring out ways for us to get above how we're going to manage through some of these challenges versus just fixated on how it's impacting or uh, um, um, influencing me Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, Cool. So one of the last questions I want to ask you um, is, you know, as, as companies, um, restaurants, cafes, what have you are possibly thinking about regenerative frameworks and possibly moving in that direction. How can these companies actually communicate about their practices and how can they encourage their guests and even the local community to be involved? 
Yeah, you know, what's interesting about that, and I, I love that idea, um, or just, you know, the question. Um, I, I wonder, um, you know, if the, 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 one of the first things I would say is that communication um, needs to be beyond just a, um, a, it needs to be more than one directional, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about how information is shared so that people understand how they can be um, supportive in this kind of um, kind of uh, a reimagining of what hospitality looks like or a restaurant or food. I mean, there's some incredible organizations out there that are con con continuing to communicate. You know, if we're, if the power of, of decision-making that, ripples through an entire industry and so I'm a big component of regenerative agriculture and food which I believe restaurants and hospitality are beginning to recognize how important that can be to influence decision making that can both regenerate soils regenerate communities regenerate uh, the potential in our organizations all from a single decision around supporting organizations that embrace this kind of philosophy and belief that there is more than than that the the whole is greater than the sum of its parts right yeah that it, it is it is not just about kind of a one plus one we believe in the exponential that happens when we regenerate across uh, an entire um, ecosystem yeah absolutely and just for, you know, as an example, some of the things we're talking about with our pre-shift members is, you know, there's a possibility or a, an opportunity that you can actually educate and nourish your guests. You know, if you work with a regenerative farmer, that doesn't mean they have to be way over there. We don't, you know, we don't deal with those people. There's a chance for, you know, that person to actually come to the restaurant and do some kind of event where people actually get to know who it is that they're, that the restaurant is buying their produce and stuff from. Um, it doesn't have yeah. to be every week. It could be a one, a one off ticketed event or something, but, um, but, yeah. but to your point, I mean, I, I think we began to recognize the power of the relationship yeah. and, and that, and we treat it as such versus a transaction. And I think that's part of what we've got to rise above in all of this is we're so used to transactions Mm. And, and when we do relationship, it's like separate from business, right? Uh, so we've siloed this into we're, we're transactions here and okay, now I'll go have a beer or wine or whiskey with somebody or build a life with somebody and it's separate from it, but it's not, it's all interrelated. Yeah. And yeah. so when we treat people transactionally in one area, it shows up in all the others. Sure. And, sure. um, and, and to me that, um, that's just got to change. So. <laughs> I, I agree, Trey. I, I agree. And so for everybody out there who is uh, listening or watching this, uh, you know, we're just scratching the surface here. Like Trey and I, what we've talked about is just one little hair of all the things that you could potentially ask or, or discuss. Um, so I would encourage people to check out In Rhythm, in Rhythm as I've said, um, uh, possibly even check out Pre-Shift if you want to have the, these discussions and, and start these conversations so that we can actually build innovative ideas. That would be you know, a great start, I think. Um, but Trey, to kind of end the conversation here, I just wanted to ask you if you could share a favorite quote of yours. Yeah, absolutely. One of the most famous designers of um, the last century uh, was Buckminster Fuller. And uh, he did an incredible amount of work to help people rethink what design is. And actually, uh, most people would contrib attribute the first use of um, regenerative to him um, back in the late 1960s uh, in the context of design. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, he's, he had this quote, which to me just is super empowering. He said, work with life-centered principles and the universe pitches in to help. And I, I think we're all looking for support. We're all looking for a way to increase our ability to bring more and I think a lot of it we're doing in conflict with the universe what does it look for us to align with it and and that's the heart of in rhythm right so we want to get in rhythm with life not being in constant dissonance with her and and that means people that means our environment uh, that means all the things that 
that we're continuing to manage. So that's, yeah. that's it. Work with life centered principles and the universe help it, helps to pitch in. That's uh, that's an amazing way to end this. <laughs> it really truly is. And you know, it's food for thought, you know, take that away and um, you know, you know, hopefully that sparks some kind of creative thought process, but uh, that's a great one. Uh, so Trey, I really appreciate you being on the call with me today. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing uh, more and having more conversations with you. Awesome. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share and, and anything, anything we can continue to do to support that, we will. So. Great.